welcome back to What the Health. I'm Julie Rovner, Chief Washington Correspondent for KFF Health News, and I'm joined by some of the best and smartest health reporters in Washington. We're taping this week on Thursday, June 6th at 10 a.m. As always, news happens fast and things might have changed by the time you hear this. So here we go. We are joined today via video conference by Alice Miranda Olstein of Politico. Hello. Sandy Araman of CQ Roll Call. Good morning. And Rachel Korzang of Stat News. Hi, everybody. Later in this episode, we'll have my interview with KFF Health News' Bram Sable-Smith, who reported and wrote this month's KFF Health News NPR Bill of the Month. It's about a free cruise that turned out to be anything but. But first, this week's news. We're going to start this week with those controversial nursing home staffing rules. In case you've forgotten, back in May, the Biden administration finalized rules that would require nursing homes that receive federal funding, which is basically all of them, to have nurses on duty 24-7, 365, uh, as well as impose other minimum staffing requirements. The nursing home industry, which has been fighting this effort literally for decades, is doing what most big, powerful health industry players do when an administration does something it doesn't like, filing lawsuits. So what is their problem with the requirement to have sufficient staff to care for patients who, by definition, can't care for themselves or they wouldn't be in nursing homes? Well, I think the groups are arguing that CMS like doesn't have authority to implement these rules and that if Congress had wanted these minimum staffing requirements, Congress should have done that and they didn't. So they're arguing that they're overstepping their boundaries. And we are seeing this lawsuit again in Texas, which is a popular venue for the healthcare industry to try to challenge rules or legislation that they don't like. So I think it isn't a surprise that we would see these groups sue, given the financial issues at stake, you know, given the fear mongering about facilities having to close and just the hiring that could have to happen for a lot of these facilities. So it's not necessarily a surprise, but it will certainly be interesting and impactful for facilities and for seniors across the nation as this plays out. I mean, basically, one of their arguments is that there just aren't enough people to hire, that they can't get the number of people that they would need. And that seems to be actually pretty persuasive argument at some point, right? I mean, there is controversy about, like, why staffing shortages happen. Like, certainly there could be issues with the pipeline or with, like, nursing schools, education. But I think there are also arguments that unions or workers' rights groups would make that maybe if facilities paid better, then they would get more people to work for them, or that people might exit the industry because of working conditions, because of understaffing, and just that that makes it harder on the workers who are actually there if they're yeah, their workloads are too much or, you know, they're expected to do more, work longer hours or overtime or their vacation is limited, that kind of thing. So I think it is a contra- surprisingly controversial issue that doesn't have an easy answer. But that's kind of the perspectives that we're seeing here. I mean, layering on to this, it's not just the industry versus the administration. Now Congress is getting into the act, which you rarely see. They're talking about using the Congressional Review Act, which is something that Congress can do. But of course, when you're in the middle of an administration that's done it, it would get vetoed by the president. So they can't probably do anything. Sandy, I see you nodding your head. These members of Congress just want to make a statement here? Yeah. So Senator James Langford ensured the resolution earlier this week to block the rules implementation It's mostly Republicans that have signed on, but we also have um, Joe Manchin and and John Tester. But the way it stands, it doesn't have enough folks on board yet to, and it would also need to be taken up. And it's just, it it faces an uphill climb like like many of these things. But Somebody actually asked me yesterday, though, can they do this? And the answer is yes, there is the Congressional Review Act. Yes, Congress, with just a majority vote and no filibuster in the Senate, can overturn an administration rule. But like I said, it usually happens when an administration changes hands because it does have to be signed by the president and the president can veto it. If the president vetoes it, then they would need a veto override majority, which they clearly don't seem to have in this case. But obviously, there there is enough concern about this issue. I think there's been a, a Congressional Review Act resolution introduced in the House, too, right? It's really tough because, you know, like Rachel said, these jobs are low paid. They're emotionally and physically grueling. It's really hard to find people willing to do this work. And at the same time, the current situation seems really untenable for patients. There's been so many reports 
of really horrible patient, you know, safety and hygiene issues and all kinds of stuff, in part, not entirely the fault of understaffing, but not helped by understaffing, certainly. And so I think, you know, like we see on so many fronts in healthcare, there are attempts to do something about this situation that has become untenable. But any attempt also will piss off someone and be challenged. Yeah, absolutely. And we should point out that this that nursing homes are staffed primarily not by nurses, but by nurses' aides of various training levels. So it, this is not entirely about a nursing shortage. It is about a shortage of workers who want to do this, as you say, very, very grueling and usually underpaid work. Um, well, speaking of controversial things, Dr. Tony Fauci, the now retired head of the NIH's National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and currently the man most conspiracy theorists hold responsible for the entire COVID-19 pandemic, testified before the House Select Committee on the pandemic Monday and not surprisingly sparks flu. What, if anything, did we learn from this hearing? The interesting part of this hearing was watching how Dr. Fauci, like, positioned himself in response to a lot of these criticisms that have been circulating. You know, the the committee has been kind of going through different witnesses and um, specifically it criticized one of his deputies, essentially, who had some unflattering emails released showing that, you know, he appeared to be trying to delete emails or use personal accounts to avoid public records requests from a journalist or, you know, other organizations. And I'm shocked, Dr. Fauci. shocked that officials would want to keep their their uh, information away from prying reporters' eyes. You know, it's not surprising, but it is surprising to see it in writing. Um, but, you know, that this is, again, as everyone was working from home and channels of communication were changing. But I think we did see Dr. Fauci pretty aggressively distancing himself, downplaying the relationship he had with this um, individual and saying that he they kind of worked on research together, but he wasn't necessarily advising agency policy. So that's at least how he was framing the relationship. So he definitely downplayed that. And I think an interesting comment he made, I'm curious to see what you think about this, Julie, but was that he didn't say that the lab leak theory itself was a conspiracy, but his involvement in like a cover up was a conspiracy. And so it did seem that some of the rhetoric has at least changed to, in, he seemed more open-minded, I guess, to a lab leak theory I, I than I expected. Was, I, say, I thought he was pretty careful about that. And I thought, I actually think that, sir, I think it was the last thing he said, which is that we're never really going to know. I mean, it could have been a lab leak. It could have happened, you know, it could have been an animal from the wet market. Um, the Chinese have not been very forthcoming with information. I personally keep wondering why we keep pounding at this. I mean, if it seems unlikely that it was a lab leak and then a conspiracy to cover it up. It clearly was one or the other. And there's a lot of differences of opinions. And that was the last thing he said, is that it could have been either. We don't know. That's always struck me as the, OK, let's talk about something else. So anyway, let's it's, talk about something else. <laughs> I do. I was just going to add, we oh, did see kind of like a, a personal side to him, which I think we we didn't see as much when he was in his official role, when he was talking, you know, it's about sort of the death threats that he and his, his family have been receiving when responding to a lot of the misinformation going around about that. And I thought that was kind of, you know, striking compared to just like juxtaposed with a lot of the other, you know, grandstanding, you know, with Marjorie Taylor Greene saying, oh, you're not a real doctor. You know, there's a lot of colorful protesters. And I just thought that was stood out too. Yeah, he. I mean, he did obviously, I think, relish the chance to defend himself from a lot of the charges that have been leveled in him. And I think he, his wife is a prominent scientist in her own right obviously can take care of herself, but I think he was particularly angry that there have been death threats leveled toward his grown daughters, which probably out of, a bit out of line. Alice, you I want to add something? Yeah, I think it's also been interesting to see the shift among Democrats on the committee over time. I think they've gone from sort of an attitude of Republicans are on a total witch hunt. This is completely political. This is muddying the waters and fueling conspiracy theories and will lead to worse public health outcomes. And I think based on some of the revelations, like Rachel said, about the uh, emails and, and such, they have sort of come to a position of, oh, there might be some things that need investigating and need accountability in here. But I think their frustration seems to be what it's always been in that, how will this lead to making the country better prepared in the future for the next pandemic, which may or not, may not already be circulating, but certainly is inevitable at some point either way. It's all well and good to hold 
officials accountable for things they may have done, but how does that lead to making the country more prepared, improving pandemic response in the future? That's sort of what they feel is the missing piece here. Yeah. And I, and I think that's there were there was not a lot of that at this hearing, although I feel like they had to go through this maybe to get over to the other side and start thinking about what what we can do in the future to avoid similar kinds of problems. And obviously, you know, you get you get a disease that you have no idea what to do about and people try to muddle through the best they can. All right. Now we are going to move on um, and we'll talk about abortion where there is always lots of news here in Washington. There is a giant inflatable IUD flying over Union Station Wednesday to highlight what seems to be contraception week on Capitol Hill. Not coincidentally, it's also the anniversary this week of the Supreme Court's 1965 ruling Griswold versus Connecticut that created the right to birth control. Um, Alice, what are Democrats, particularly in the Senate where they're in charge, doing to try to highlight these potential threats to contraceptive access? Yeah. So this vote that happened that was, you know, blocked because only two Republicans crossed the aisle to support this right to contraception bill. It's the two you expect. It's Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins. And you're already seeing Democrats really make hay of this, both uh, Democrats and their campaign arms and outside allied groups are planning to just absolutely blitz this in ads. They're holding events in swing states related to it, and they're going hard against individual Republicans for their votes. I think the Republicans I talked to who voted no, they had kind of a funny mixed message about why they were voting no on it. They were both saying that the bill was this sinister Trojan horse for forcing uh, you know, religious groups to promote contraception and even abortion and also gender affirming care somehow. But also the bill was a pointless stunt that wouldn't really do anything because there is no threat to contraception. But also Republicans have their own rival bill to promote access to contraception. So access to contraception isn't a problem, but please support my bill to improve access to contraception. It, it's it's a tough message. <laughs> um, it, where, <laughs> whereas Democrats' message is, uh, you know, a lot simpler. You can argue with it on the merits, but it's a lot simpler. They point to the fact that um, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas has expressed interest and actually called on the court to revisit precedents that protect the right to contraception. Lots of states have uh, thwarted attempts to enact protections for contraception. And a lot of anti-abortion groups have really made a big push to muddy the waters on medical understanding of what is contraception versus what is abortion, which we can get into <laughs> later. <laughs> which we, yes, which we will want. Sandy, did you want to add something? Yeah, and I think that something that I would add to what Alice was saying is just how this is kind of at the same time a little bit different for for the Democrats. Like something that I wrote about this week was just that, you know, after the Dobbs decision, we had the then Democratic House vote on several different bills, but the Democrats have not really been holding this like chamber wide vote on bills related to, you know, abortion contraception for the most part. And so this was was the first time that they are kind of stepping into that. They've done the like unanimous consent requests on a lot of these bills. And even just like a couple months ago when, you know, talks are really heating up on on IVF, there's there's other things that we have to get to, appropriations and things like that. And, you know, this would just get bogged down and they were kind of shying away from taking floor time to do this. So I think that was kind of an interesting move that they're doing this now and that they're going to vote on an IVF next week and, and whatever else next down the line. Yeah, I noticed that as soon as this bill went down, Senator Schumer teed up the right to IVF bill for a vote next week. But Alice, as you were sort of alluding to, I mean, where this gets really uncomfortable for Republicans is that sort of fine line between contraception and abortion. Um, our colleague, Lauren Weber has a story about this this week, um, which is your extra credit. So why don't you tell us about it? Yeah. So she did a really great job highlighting how, especially at the state level where a lot of these battles are playing out, anti-abortion groups that are very influential are making arguments that certain forms of birth control are abortifacients. This is 
completely disputed by medical experts and the FDA that regulates these products. They say, just to be clear about what we're talking about, we're talking about some forms of emergency contraception, which is taken after sex to prevent pregnancy. It is not an abortifacient. It won't work if you're already pregnant. It prevents pregnancy. It does not terminate a pregnancy. They are also saying this about some IUDs, interuterine devices, and even about some hormonal birth control pills. So there's been pushback that Lauren detailed in her story, including from some Republicans who are trying to correct the record. But this misinformation is getting really entrenched. And I think it's something we should all be paying attention to when it crops up, especially uh, in the mouths of people in power. Yeah, I mean, it started out, I mean, when I first started writing about it, it was not entirely clear. There was thought that one of the ways the morning after pill worked was by preventing implantation of a fertilized egg, which some people consider, if you consider that fertilization and not implantation is the beginning of life and the beginning, you know, according to doctors, implantation is the beginning of pregnancy, among other things, because that's when you can test for it. But those who believe that fertilization is the beginning of life and therefore it's something that prevents implantation is an abortion were concerned that IUDs and mostly progesterone-based birth control that prevented implantation were abortifacients, except that in the years since, it's been shown that that's not the case. That in right. fact, both IUDs and the morning after pill work by preventing ovulation. There is no fertilized egg because there's no egg. So they are not abortifacients. On the other hand, the FDA changed changed the labeling on the morning after pill because of this. Uh, and yet the Hobby Lobby case that was uh, the decision was written by Justice Alito uh, basically took that premise that they were allowed to not offer these forms of contraception because they believed that they were acted as abortifacients, even though science suggested that they didn't. So this is not something it's not something new and it's not something I don't think is going to go away anytime in the near future. <laughs> I would add that it also came up in this week's Senate help hearing, that line of questioning about whether or not different forms of birth control were abortifacients. You know, Senator Murray did that line of questioning with um, Dr. Christina Francis, who's the head of the anti-abortion obstetrician gynecology group, and went through on, you know, plan B, IUDs and, and different things. And there was a back and forth of, you know, evading questions. But she did con call IUDs as abortifacients, which, you know, goes back to the same thing that, that we're saying. Right, and which I, they have done all along. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this really spotlights a challenge here, which is that Republicans' response to votes like this week and things that are playing out in the state level, they're sort of scoffing and saying it's absolutely ridiculous to suggest that Republicans are trying to ban birth control. This is completely a political concoction by Democrats to scare people into voting for them in November. What we're talking about here are not bans on birth control, but there are policies that have been introduced at both the state and federal level that would make birth control, especially certain forms like we were just talking about, way harder to access. So there are proposals to carve them out of Obamacare's contraception mandate so they're not covered by insurance. That's not a ban. You can still go pay out of pocket. But I remember all the people who were paying out of pocket for IUDs before Obamacare hundreds and hundreds of dollars uh, for something that is now completely free. And so what we're seeing right now are not bans, but I think it's important to think about the ways it would still restrict access for a lot of people. Before we leave the nation's capital, it seems that the Supreme Court's upcoming decision on the abortion pill may not be the last word on the case. While it seemed likely from the oral arguments that the justices will agree that the Texas doctors who brought the case don't have standing, there were three state attorneys general who sought to become part of the case when it was first considered uh, back in Texas. So it would go back to uh, to Judge Kaczmarek, our, our original judge who said that the, the entire abortion pill approval should be overturned. It feels like this is not the end of fighting about the abortion pills approval at the federal level. I mean, I assume that that's something that the drug industry, among others, won't be happy about. Courts could find that the states don't have standing either, that this policy does not harm them in any real way. In fact, Democratic attorneys general have argued the exact opposite, that the availability of mifepristone helps states, saves a lot of money, it prevents pregnancy, it, it treats people's medical means. So obviously, Kazmarek has a very long anti-abortion record and has, you know, sided with these challenges in a lot of cases. But that, you know, that doesn't mean that this would necessarily go anywhere. 
But your bigger point that the Supreme Court's upcoming ruling on Mifepristone is not the end. It certainly is not. There's going to be a lot more court challenges, some already in motion. There's going to be state level policy fights. There's going to be federal level policy fights. If Trump is elected, groups want him to do a lot of things through executive order to restrict Mifepristone or, you know, remove it from the market entirely through the FDA. So, yes, this this is not going to be over for the foreseeable future. Well, meanwhile, in a case that might be over for the foreseeable future, the Texas Supreme Court last week officially rejected the case brought by 20 women who nearly died when they were unable to get timely care for pregnancy complications. The justices said in their ruling that while the women definitely did suffer, the fault lay with the doctors who declined to treat them rather than the vagueness of the state's abortion ban. So where does that leave the debate about medical exceptions? So anti-abortion groups' response to a lot of the challenges to these abortion bans and stories about, you know, women in medical emergencies who are getting denied care and suffering, you know, real harm as a result, their response has been that there is nothing wrong with the law, the law is perfectly clear, and that doctors are either accidentally or intentionally misinterpreting the law for political reasons. Meanwhile, doctors say it's not clear at all. It's not clear how honestly close to dead someone has to be in order to receive an abortion and whether... And it's not just in Texas. This is true in a bunch of states, right? In, that, in that many states, don't know, exactly. Right. Exactly. When they can intervene. Right. And so I think the upcoming Supreme Court ruling on Mtala, which we've talked about, could give some indication either way of what doctors are and are not able to do. But that won't really resolve it either. Um, there is still so much gray area. And so patients and doctors are going to state courts to plead for clarity. They're going to their legislatures to plead for clarity. And they're going to state medical boards, including in Texas, to plead for clarity. And so far, they have not gotten any. Most legislatures have been unwilling to revisit their bans and, you know, clarify or expand the exceptions, even as these stories play out on the ground of doctors who say, I know that providing an abortion for this patient is the right thing medically and ethically to do, but I'm so afraid of being hit with criminal charges that I put the patient on a plane out of state instead. Yeah, it's it's just really tough. And, and and so what we wrote about is we keep talking about doctors being torn between conflicting state and federal law. And that's absolutely true. But what we dug into is that the state law just looms so much larger than the federal laws. So when you're weighing, should I maybe violate EMTALA or should I maybe violate my state's ban? They're not going to want to violate their state's ban because that means jail time. That means losing their license. That means having their freedom and their livelihood uh, taken away, whereas an MTELA violation may or may not mean a fine somewhere down the road. The enforcement has not been as aggressive at the federal level from the Biden administration as a lot of doctors would like it to be. And so in that environment, they're really deferring to the state law. And that means some people are not getting care that they maybe need. I say in the meantime, we had yet another story just last week about a woman who had a miscarriage and could not get a DNC, basically, which for, you know, she went when she went in, there was no fetal heartbeat, but she ended up miscarrying at home and almost dying. She was sent away, I believe, from three different facilities. So it was, you know, this continues to happen because doctors are concerned about when they can, when it is appropriate for them to intervene. Uh, and they seem, you're right, to be sort of, sort of leaning towards the let's not let's not get in trouble with the state law. So let's wait to provide care as long as we think we can. Well, moving on, we have two stories this week about efforts to treat post-traumatic stress disorder, particularly in military veterans. On Tuesday, an FDA advisory committee recommended against approval of the psychedelic MDMA, better known as ecstasy, for the treatment of PTSD. My understanding is that the panel didn't reject the idea outright that this could be helpful, only that there isn't enough evidence yet to approve it. Is I Was I reading that right? Rachel, you guys covered this pretty closely. Yes. Yeah, my colleagues did cover this. Um, and it certainly, I think, was a discouraging sign. I don't think there's any way around it for some of these companies that are looking at psychedelics and, you know, trying to figure out some sort of approval pathway for conditions like PTSD. One of my colleagues, Megan Keshavon, she chatted with like a dozen companies yesterday and they were trying to put a positive spin on it that having some sort of opinion or some discussion of a treatment like this by the advisory committee could lay out more clear standards for what companies would have to present in order to get something 
thing approved. So I think obviously they have a vested interest in spinning this positively, but um, it is a very innovative space and certainly was a short-term setback, but it certainly isn't a long-term issue, you know, if some of these companies are able to present stronger evidence or better better trial design. Um, I think there were some questions about whether trial participants actually could figure out whether they were placebo or not, which if you're taking um, a psychedelic drug, yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of a challenge in terms of trial design. So I think there are some interesting questions, and I am confident that this will be something the FDA and industry is going to have to figure out in a space um, that's new like this. Yeah, it's been interesting to follow. Well, in something that does seem to help, one of the first controlled studies of service dogs to treat PTSD has found that man's best friend can be a therapist as well. Those veterans who got specially trained dogs showed much more improvement in their symptoms than those who were on the doggy wait list, as determined by professionals who didn't know who had the dogs and who didn't. So pet therapy for the win here? I mean, this yeah. is the kind of the biggest study of, of this kind that we've had so far, and it seems promising. And, you know, I think one thing will be interesting is, you know, if there's more research, if this would change policy down the line for for the VA or or other agencies to be able to get these kinds of service dogs in the hands of, of more pets. Yeah, I know there's I mean, huge demand for for these kinds of service dogs, Um, sort of as there. I know a lot of people who train who basically have started training service dogs for veterans. Um, and there's just sort of obviously they were able to do this study because there was a long wait list. <laughs> they were able to, to look at people who were who were waiting but hadn't gotten a dog yet. So at least in the short term, possibly some help for some people. Finally this week in a segment I'm calling Misery Loves Company, it's not just the U.S. where big health systems are getting cyber hacked. Across the pond, quoting here from the BBC, major hospitals in London have declared a critical incident after a cyber attack led to operations being canceled and emergency patients being diverted elsewhere. This sounds painfully familiar. Um, maybe we need an international cyber crime fighting agency. Is there one? Is there at least, do we know, is there a task force working on this? Obviously, you know, the, the bigger, the more centralized your healthcare system, the bigger problem this becomes, as we saw with Change Healthcare belonging to United. And this is now, I guess it's a contractor that works for the NHS. You can see the potential for really bad stuff here. That's a good question about some sort of international like standards, Julie. But I think what we have seen is Senator Ron Wyden, who leads the Senate Finance Committee, did write to HHS this week and ask HHS to add like to multiple factor authentication as kind of a condition of participation for some of these facilities um, to try to institute standards that way. And again, I think there are questions about how much HHS can actually do. But I think it's a signal that Congress might not want to do anything or think they can do anything if they're asking the administration to do something here. But we're still in like the very early stages of the systems, like viewing this as worthy of investment and um, just education about kind of some of the best practices here. Yeah, certainly it's going to be a business opportunity for, you know, some consulting firms to help, you know, these hospitals increase their cybersecurity measures and certainly will be a global market if uh, we see these attacks continue in other places. Maybe too. our health records will be as protected as our Spotify accounts. That would apparently be a step forward. All right. Well, that is the news for this week. Now we will play my Bill of the Month interview with Bram Sable-Smith, and then we will come back and do our extra credits. I am pleased to welcome back to the podcast my KFF Health News colleague, Bram Sable-Smith, who reported and wrote the latest KFF Health News NPR Bill of the Month about a free cruise that turned out to be anything but. Welcome back to the podcast, Bram. Thanks for having me. So tell us about this month's patient, who he is, and what happened to him. This is one of the wilder bills of the month, I think. Right. So uh, his name is Vincent Wozni. He lives in Saginaw, Michigan. Never been on an airplane before. Neither had his wife, Sarah. But when they bought their first house in 2019, their realtor, as a gift, gifted them tickets for a cruise. My realtor gave me a tote bag. So what a realtor, first of all, like what an incredible gift. My realtor gave me a wine opener, which I do still use. <laughs> if it sailed to the Caribbean, it'd be equivalent. So 
their cruise got delayed uh, because of the pandemic, but they set sail in December 2022. And, you know, they were having a great time. One of the highlights of their trip was they went to this private island called Coco Key for Royal Caribbean guests. And it included an excursion to go swimming with pigs. Wild pigs, right? Wild pigs, a big fancy water park, all kinds of like food. They're having a great time. But it's also on that island that Vincent started feeling off. And so in the past, Vincent has had seizures. About 10 years earlier, he had had a few seizures. They decided he was probably epileptic and he was on medicine for a while. He went off the medicine because they were worried about liver damage. And he'd been relatively seizure free for a long time. It'd been a long time since he'd had a seizure. But when he was on that island having a great time, it's when he started to feel off. And when they got back on the cruise ship for the last full day of the cruise, he had a seizure in his room. And he was taken down to the medical center on the cruise ship. And he was observed. He was given fluids for a while and then sent back to his room where he had a second seizure. Once again, went down to the medical center on the ship where he had a third seizure. It was time to get him off the boat. He needed to get onto land and go to a hospital. And so they were close enough to land that they were able to do the evacuation by boat instead of having to do something like a helicopter to do a medevac that way. And so uh, a rescue boat came to the ship. He was lowered off the ship. He was in a stretcher and was lowered down to the rescue boat by a rope. His fiance Sarah, climbed down a rope ladder to get into the boat as well to go with him to land. And then he was taken to land in an ambulance ride to the hospital, etc. But before they were allowed to disembark, they were given their bill and told, it's time to pay this. You have to pay this bill. And how much was it? So... The bill for the medical services was $2,500. This was a free cruise. They had budgeted to pay for internet, $150 for internet. They had budgeted to pay for their alcoholic drinks. They had budgeted to pay for their tips. So they had saved up a few hundred dollars, which is what they thought would be their bill at the end of this cruise. Now, that completely exploded into this $2,500 bill just for medical expenses alone. And as they're waiting to evacuate the ship, they're like, we can't pay this. We, we don't have this money. So that led to some negotiations. They ended up basically taking all the money out of their bank accounts, including their mortgage payment. They maxed out Vincent's credit card, but they're still $1,000 short. And they later learned once they were on land that Vincent's credit card had been overdrafted by $1,000 to cover that additional expense. So it turns out that he was uninsured at the time, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But even if he had had insurance, the cruise ship wasn't going to let him off the boat until he paid in full, even though it was an emergency. Did I read that right? That's certainly the feeling that they had at the time. When Vincent was short the $1,000, eventually they, they were let off the ship. But they did end up, you know, as we said, getting that credit card overdrafted. But I think what's important to note here is that even though he was uninsured at the time, even if he had had insurance, and even if he had had travel insurance, which he also did not have at the time, which we can talk about, he still would have been required to pay up front and then submit the receipts later uh, to try to get reimbursed for the payments. And that's because on the cruise's website, they explain that they do not accept quote, land-based health insurance plans when they're on the vessel. In fact, as you mentioned, a lot of health insurance doesn't cover care on a cruise ship or, in fact, anywhere outside the United States. So lots of people buy travel insurance in case they have a medical emergency. Why didn't they? (laughs) So travel insurance is often purchased when you purchase the tickets. You'll, You'll buy a ticket to the cruise and then it will prompt you, say, hey, Do you want some travel insurance to protect you while you're on this ship? And that's the way that most people are buying travel insurance. Well, remember, this cruise was a gift from their realtors. So they never bought the ticket, so they never got that prompting to say, hey, time to buy some travel insurance to protect yourself on the trip. And again, these were inexperienced travelers. They'd never been on an airplane before. The furthest either one of them had been from Michigan was Vincent went to Washington, D.C. one time on a school trip. And so they didn't really know what travel insurance was. They knew it existed. But as Vincent explained, he said, I thought this was for like lost luggage and trip cancellations. I didn't realize that this was something for medical expenses you might incur when you're out at sea. And it's really both. I mean, it is for lost luggage and cancellation, right? And it is for lost luggage and cancellation. Yeah, that's right. So what eventually happened to Vincent and what eventually happened to the bill? 
Well, once he got taken to the hospital, he got an additional bill, or actually several additional bills, um, one from the hospital, two from a couple doctors who saw him at the hospital who billed separately, and also one from the ambulance services. As we know, he'd already drained his bank account and maxed out his credit card and had it overdrafted to cover the expenses on the ship, so he was working on paying those off. And then for the additional bills he incurred on land, he had set up payment plans, really small ones, you know, $25, $50 a month, but going to four separate entities. He actually missed a couple payments on his bill to the hospital, and that ended up getting sent to collections. Again, none of these are charging interest, but these are still quite some burdens. And so he was paying them off bit by bit by bit. He set up a GoFundMe campaign, which is something that a lot of people end up doing who never expect to have to cover these kinds of emergency expenses or or reach out publicly for help like that. And they got quite a bit of help from family and friends, including, you know, Vincent picked up Frisbee golf during the pandemic, and he's made quite a lot of good friends that way. And that community really came through for them as well. So with those GoFundMe payments, they were able to make their house payment. It was helpful with some of these bills that they had lingering left over from the cruise. So what's the takeaway here, other than that nothing that seems free is ever really free? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. Well, the takeaway is to be informed before you leave about a plan for how are you going to cover medical expenses when you're going traveling. I think this is something that a lot of people are going to be doing this summer, going on vacations. I've got vacations planned. What's your plan for covering medical expenses? And if you're leaving the country, if you're going on a cruise, someplace where your land-based American health insurance might not cover you, you should consider travel insurance. And when you're considering travel insurance, they come in all sorts of varieties. So you want to make sure that they're going to cover your particular cases. So some plans, for example, won't cover pre-existing conditions. Some plans won't cover care for risky activities like rock climbing. So you want to know what you're going to be doing during your trip, and you want to make sure when you're purchasing travel insurance to find a plan that's going to cover your particular needs. Very well explained. Bram Sable-Smith, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. And now it's time for our extra credit segment. That's when we each recommend a story we read this week we think you should read too. As always, don't worry if you miss it. We will post the links on the podcast page at kffhealthnews.org and in our show notes on your phone or other mobile device. Uh, Alice, you've gone already. Sandia, why don't you go next? My extra credit is Roanoke's Requiem, and it's an airmail from Clara Malo. And this is a really interesting piece. So at least 16 alumni from the classes of 2011 to 2019 of Roanoke have been diagnosed with cancer since 2010, which is a much higher rate when compared to the rate for 20-somethings in the U.S. and 15 times higher mortality rate. And so the piece does some looking at some of the work that's being done to uncover why this is happening. It's it's quite a scary story. Rachel. Um, Yeah. So the story I chose, it was co-published by ProPublica in Mississippi Today. The headline is, This Mississippi Hospital Transfers Some Patients to Jail to Await Mental Health Treatment by Isabel Taft. And I mean, truly such a harrowing story of, you know, obviously we know that there's capacity issues with mental health treatment, but the idea that patients would be involuntarily committed, go to a hospital, and then be transferred to a jail, uh, having committed no crime, you know, having no recourse. I mean, some of these detentions happened, it was like two months long, where these patients who are already suffering, you know, are then thrown out of their comfortable environments into jail. And as they kind of awaited county facilities to open up spots for them. And I think the story also did a good job of pointing out that other jurisdictions have found other solutions to this other than placing suffering people in jail. So yeah, it just felt like it was a really great classic example of investigative journalism that'll have an impact. Local investigative journalism, not just investigative journalism, which is really rare, yet was a really good piece. Well, my extra credit this week is from Jessica Valenti, who writes a super helpful newsletter called Abortion Every Day. Usually it's an aggregation of stories from around the country, but this week she also has her own exclusive about how heart Beat International, which runs the nation's largest network of crisis pregnancy centers, is collecting and sharing private health data, including due dates, dates of last menstrual periods, addresses, and even family living arrangements. Isn't this a 
violation of HIPAA, you may ask? Well, probably not, because HIPAA only applies to healthcare providers and insurers, and the vast majority of crisis pregnancy centers don't deliver medical care. You don't need a medical license to give a pregnancy test or even do an ultrasound. Among other things, personal health data has been used for training sales staff and, until recently, was readily available to anyone on the web without password protection. It's a pretty eye-opening story. All right, that is our show. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We'd appreciate it if you left us a review. That helps other people find us too. Special thanks, as always, to our technical guru, Francis Ying, and our fill-in editor this week, Stephanie Stapleton. As always, you can email us your comments or questions. We're at what the health, all one word, at kff.org. Or you can still find me at X. I'm at J. Robner. Sandia? At Sandia Writes. Alice? At Alice Olstein. Rachel? At Rachel Course. We will be back in your feed next week. Until then, be healthy.